I was in Matt Snip's class, and he was showing projector slides of the United States at different times in history. And he had said, this is the best I can do to show you the change over time. And I knew that it was a lot different than that. I knew the story of my reservation was a lot different than that. In one of the maps that I've seen, my reservation doesn't even exist. They, they thought they were going to get rid of it, so it's just not even on there. The Fort Peck Reservation is in the far northeast corner of Montana. I live in Poplar, which is one of the four towns. It's got about 2,000 people, and I live on the edge of that town. It's really open. Once you step out of town, you can hear somebody coming from about 10 miles away. My schooling growing up was a lot different. I found out then a vast majority of the Stanford students here. It really wasn't geared towards making sure that people went on to more education. And so it was a difficult transition from a high school that didn't expect you to really go anywhere to Stanford who expects you to go everywhere. As far as being Lakota, I think I've been pretty well grounded since birth, knowing exactly kind of who I was, where I came from. My great grandpa and all of his siblings were really, really involved in the legislation for getting the Black Hills back. Still fighting for what we've been fighting for for over 100 years. It really makes you think about, well, why, why are we still fighting for this? Oh yeah, because it's still ours and it's still important and it's, it's central to who we are. The difference between wisdom culturally at home and here at Stanford is definitely a stark difference. I think wisdom at home encompasses more of a person's entire life and the things that you can pass on to others. Whereas wisdom here is based mostly in books that, that a lot of other people write. At home there's a sense of our knowledge is more important than the knowledge that a school or an institution like Stanford can give you. There's a lot of people who will say that it's not even worth it to leave to go to school and to get that kind of white education. There are other people who do see the value in it, who see our place as Indians within the greater American society as needing people who walk two worlds Having some kind of role model like Professor Snip has been, it's made coming to Stanford okay. He's taken this education that he got and used it in a lot of ways for Indian country as a whole. It's a fine line that he walks between Indian country and Stanford University, but I think he does it in a way that I hope that I can do someday to keep that cultural awareness in a world that's so far from it. There's a reason why Stanford has such a, a vibrant Indian community here. This is a place where we can feel comfortable and we have the people and the resources here to make that possible. We're at, we're gonna fly our room all over Palo Alto on the 18th, oh wow. Okay. We don't have a family here, but we definitely have the closest thing you can get to it. And our native professors are definitely the head of the household. So they've got like the northern head drum, the southern head drum. The decision to come here to Stanford had a lot to do with the presence of Luis Fraga and, and someone here who was doing uh, research in my area. Um, during the, the period when we didn't have any diversity faculty in political science. I think Admit Weekend, for example, was a real struggle for us to make a case for our program to the diversity students. The students that are accepted to Stanford Political Science are also visiting Harvard Political Science, Princeton Political Science, Yale Political Science. These are the top students in political science in the country. And when they come here to Stanford, and they realize that there are very few faculty members who are doing research on populations that are underrepresented, it's very easy for them to say, well, this, this institution just isn't going to be as supportive 
as another institution. And so our loss of these students to other institutions, I think, is pretty serious. Now I am a fourth year PhD candidate. I've been advanced to candidacy. And just this year, our department hired a new senior faculty member, Gary Segura, and he studies minority political behavior and representation with an emphasis on Latinos. Josh Pasek, who is a John student, close John student. And I've already managed to take quite a bit advantage of him and his expertise. When the scholar does come from a minority uh, background, let's say, um, I think they do bring something extra to both to the way in which they do their research, but also to the way in which they, they share their research with others. He, no, not particularly well. He's a comparator, but, but uh. he was one of my section chairs when I was program chair. For me and Gary, I, I think it has been important. Gary is, is a half Mexican gay man, and some of the comments that he's able to bring to the table without hesitation and without second guessing or without worrying about political correctness, he really can sort of get to the core of some of these issues and, and talk about them freely. Contact Shanto, call. Okay, see you, Gary. So while we spend a lot of time looking at coefficients and you know, standard errors uh, on some variable that, that captures, say, experiences with discrimination, I think someone like, like Gary um, uh, has a little more respect for the significance of that variable. Here at Stanford, I find that uh, in my race and ethnicity classes, I am either the only or one of very few white students in those classes. But I believe that as graduating college students, as we're going out into the world, having that background in diversity, the education, and the history to face the diverse work settings that we'll be going into is really an important part of our education. And by having students of color and professors of color in all disciplines forces other students who would otherwise shy away from those experiences to begin to see that we can all work together no matter what we're working towards. I think that Stanford has a responsibility to create the diversity here that they wish to see in the rest of the world. Stereotype threat is, it's the experience of being in a situation uh, or doing something for which a negative stereotype about one of your group identities is relevant. Um, uh, as, when you're in that situation, you kind of implicitly know that you could be uh, judged or treated in terms of that stereotype. You're doing something for which you know your group is negatively stereotyped. Our research shows, after many years, it can reliably interfere with your performance in that area. People think of, of something like that that would interfere with performance as, as something that would affect students with lower self-esteem or lower uh, skills, but no, it's quite the reverse, uh, that the student, the woman who really identifies with succeeding in science and math, uh, as she moves up the ladder of, of, of coursework and experiences more and more frustration, uh, it's, it's, it's that kind of person who's going to be most upset by the prospect of being stereotyped. So it becomes a, a haunting kind of a, a threat. It's not just a, something that happens once and goes away. And that's what makes it as powerful as it can be, and, and it, it powerful enough to affect the course of a person's life, the kind of choices they make. Do they want to persist in an area where they feel this kind of tension, or do they want to find a domain where they can feel more comfortable? I think when people kind of pull the concept out and look at it very closely, how it works down on the ground of somebody's experience in a classroom and in a university, they can get a better sense of, of how this thing that seems so abstract can have such concrete, profound effects on people's lives. I think what, what really helped me and the biggest challenge and the thing that I that sort of I had to debunk for myself was this idea that this school had the Albert Einsteins of the world. But I also felt that someone like me with my background probably could not get through it. I mean, I was very, very skeptical, very doubtful of my abilities. 
And then I remember walking into Professor Al Camarillo's talk. During that time, uh, during Anatomy Week, you had the opportunity to sit in on, on class lectures. And I chose his, um, his lecture mostly because I recognized his last name as Camarillo. I'm like, oh, he, I, I mean, I might understand him a little bit more. And I walked into his classroom and he started talking about Compton. I just felt really engaged in the conversation. A big part of that being because every time he said something, it set off this memory in my head about where I grew up. It started contextualizing my experiences. For me, it was inspiring to see a Stanford professor at a research university, very well known nationally, internationally, talk about how he's researching the things that he's always been curious about in terms of how he grew up um, and the area he lived in. And I thought that I saw myself doing the same thing, getting a better intellectual academic picture of my experiences at home. My honors thesis is on the parental participation of low-income and immigrant Mexican parents and their high school students. I wanted to make sure that I did an honors thesis that explored a research question directly from the community I came from. The winner of this year's Arturo Islas Award was Sergio. For most of my experiences here at Stanford, I felt that I've always been encouraged to do research. I was just afraid to do research because I didn't know what I was getting myself into. And having faculty of color here had really helped sort of give me that little nudge, that little bit of inspiration to really pursue what I was passionate about and do research on it. The degree to which a person experiences stereotype threat in a setting often depends less on things about the person than they do about the setting. The cues, the number of elements in a situation which suggest that they might be being seen that way. There are interesting studies showing that in these kinds of situations, the amygdala, the part of the brain that's very sensitive to threat, is activated. So when a woman walks into a junior level math class and she's the only woman there, the class has a kind of male culture to it. There are a variety of things that could be signals to her that being a woman, is she's, she's going to be more marginalized here. Uh, so her, her tension there may be less about her own confidence in her abilities than, it, than they are about her confidence to be safe in this situation and to be comfortable in this situation as time goes on. So I had come here with this idea that I really wanted to study the interaction between biology and possibly micro devices. And so I had been rotating through uh, Beth Pruitt's lab, and she introduced me to my co-advisor, Ellen Cool, who is in computational biomechanics. Because he might even invite his professor who does biomem stuff. I think he would find what you're doing very interesting, too. And I think what's cool, actually, is that I think I'm the first mechanical engineering student to be co-advised by two women. The only times when it would matter that my advisor is, is female is just that you have these bad days. And on the days when you don't feel like doing it anymore, it's nice to have someone you can relate to, and it's nice to see that you're not on a dead-end course. I always imagine this sort of invisible filtering step where you go from having a class of like 50% women, and then suddenly there are no female professors. And so I assume something in the middle happens. And maybe I shouldn't bother if that's the case. Maybe show some plans for... It's nice if you're questioning your 